Video game collisions, they never fail. E except, of course, when they do. Um, uh, uh, and oh boy, do they fail. They can be funny. <laughs> they can be weird. Leon, what are you doing? Don't even think about trying this yourself. Entertaining. Your subpixels just get more messed up as yeah. oh, yeah. Memorable. Let me in. What? This is a bug? Annoying. And they can be mysterious, and I'd like to peek behind the curtain to reveal to you the actual code and why these glitches happen. The ones you might see a skilled speedrunner take full advantage of. Nice. No, easy. No. They are masters at finding and exploiting these gaps in the code. Yeah, you have to grab them through the other side, okay. Just hold down and jump, and that will push Mario out the door. Collision detection is hard. I shared one of my own 3D demos on the old Game Boy Advance, and almost the next day, someone posted how to break through those walls and into the unknown. Well, not anymore. This time, it's personal. And I've got no room for glitches in my life. I'm here to tackle this head on. Collision detection, you better be ready because I'm coming for you. No more hiding out of bounds. Cage match style, no exit, no rules. I've got my programming gloves on, so let's settle this once and for all. We'll see whose walls break down first. And spoiler alert, it ain't gonna be mine. So let's go. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so let's go. Well, I'm recording my collision detection from the ground up, step by step, so you can program along with me, or just watch the code to see how it works. And I'll be recreating some of these glitches so you can see why they happen. Oh, okay. What just happened? What just happened? I don't understand. What? So here is my starter file in C and OpenGL, and I'll add a link to the video on how to install both, but you can follow and convert this to any language you like. Just be able to move around and draw a line, that's it. And I'll very quickly walk through my starter file. I have a struct to hold the player information, like position, rotation, and the vector x and y direction, and I have an array of structs for the walls, each with two x and y points and a color variable and a line function to draw those two connected points with a color, a move function so looking left increases the player's rotation up to 2 pi, and then it loops back around to 0, and we save that angle in the sine and cosine of the player's vector, so we can use that to move the player forward or backwards. We have a function to loop through and draw each wall, and a function to draw the player and its vector. And this variable is from the windows.h header file. It increases by a thousand every second. I divide that by 50, which means this if statement updates 20 times a second, giving me a constant frame rate. I need an initialize function called once at the beginning where I set the wall and player variables. And normally when OpenGL reads a keyboard button, there's a delay, so I'm turning a global variable immediately on or off for consistency. And this is just a typical OpenGL main loop to create the window, and I put the origin in the bottom left corner. Okay, so this is my basic starter file. You can use this or something similar if you want to follow along. But now, let's actually program collisions and wall sliding, starting by creating a vertical line. Use any units that you like, but I'm using x and y at 400-400 to 400-200. Let's make a global variable to hold the number of walls, all one of them right now, and create our collision function. And if you think about it, we only need to check for collisions if we actually move forward or backwards. That's the only time. And we'll loop through the number of walls and hold the temp variables since we don't want to actually edit the array values. And we'll also hold the difference in the x and y values. If both x values subtract to equal 0, then it's a vertical line. And we like that since the player's distance to the line is always the x difference between the player and the line. So let's hold that absolute difference. And I'll print out that value to show you. So here's that distance getting closer to 0, and now it's increasing as we move further away. Great. So now let's define just how far we want to stay away from the wall, as maybe 32. Then add an if statement to check if we're within that range. And if we order the y values from bottom to top, we can make sure that if the player is below the bottom point, minus our offset, or if the player is above the top point plus our offset, then we can continue and we can skip this wall. We're not even close to it. And let's shrink that edge offset in half. And I'll show you why coming up very soon. Okay, so if the player made it past all of this, then we're within range, and we need to push that player's X position back to the offset. Left of the wall, we need to subtract that difference between the offset and the player's distance. And check that out, we're subtracting the X and only using the Y movement, which makes it look like we're sliding. And it works great on this side, but not so much on the other side. It looks like it's actually getting a speed boost through the wall. So we need an else statement to add the difference if we're on the other side. And note that this works for going backwards too, since all we care about is the X position inside the wall offset. So to recap, is it a vertical line? Is the player's distance less than our wall's offset? Are we within the Y range of the wall, including that extra off the edges? If all these checks pass, 
and push back the player that small difference, only allowing the Y movement. And just watch me do this part, I temporarily made it so that if I press the F button, I'll move a greater distance than our wall offset. So here we go, I can't pass through the wall at this speed, but if I travel too fast, there, I can pass entirely over the wall's offset range. Game developers try to limit your player's top speed, but speedrunners try to find a way to move faster, causing them to pass through the walls and that offset. So let's prevent this by reverting back to our original speed. Okay, so that is a vertical line. A horizontal line is basically exactly the same, but with every variable flipped. So now it's horizontal if the change in y values are the same. y is now the distance, and we order the x from left to right, and we add that offset to the x edges, and finally push back the player's y value, only allowing the x to slide. Oh, and we need to add one to the total walls, and then initialize this wall horizontally. Update the drawing function to our global variable, so we can actually draw this wall too. And check that out, we have two working wall collisions the player cannot pass through. It's working well, and a lot of old school games only use these two collisions. And hey, do you remember when I said I'll show you why we cut the edges offset in half? Well, here's why. Without that smaller offset on the edges, one wall's offset can trigger past another wall. We don't want our player to get stuck randomly out there, which sometimes does happen in video games. The smallest offset can catch the player just right. So let's go back to half the edge offset, since that worked pretty well. And most importantly, our corners are well defended. Corners are often a weak spot that speedrunners try to penetrate through, but not our walls. And look at what happens when we use half the offset of the player's rebound. Once the player gets in, he can't get out. That player is stuck there forever. And this has personally happened to me in a couple video games that I can remember playing. I had to restart the game, there was no other way. But I think it's just interesting to show you the code and how these glitches are actually working. And if you think about it, this wall offset is actually the player's radius. If we increase it, then the player will get even farther away from the wall, so you have more room to draw the player's 2D image or even 3D polygons. So we got a vertical wall, we have a horizontal wall, lastly we need an angled wall. Let's increase the total number of walls, and the player has a vector direction, and now we need our walls to have one too. Let's set up an angled wall line and see how it looks. We need to pre-calculate this vector of the wall, but we only need to do it once at the very beginning, since our walls don't move. It's just the difference between the x and y divided by the magnitude of the vector line. And we can't divide by zero, but we can come pretty close. And I'm a visual person, so I want to actually see this vector line. So if we add the line's x values and divide by 2, we get the average, or the middle x, and same for the y. So let's plot this center point, but add the wall's vector times by 20 so we can see it and my compiler didn't like that I didn't define W, so here you go compiler. Alright, so you can see our normal vector is facing inward, and if you flip these two points, then the vector will flip too, but I like it this way, so let's keep it. So the vertical and horizontal distance is simply the difference in that access to the player, but diagonal, you can't do that. We need to find the exact closest center point, and to do that we need to hold the player's difference to the first point, get the dot product between the two vectors, and divide by the length of the line. And I'm preventing a divide by zero here too. And what you're going to notice is that value reads zero at the first point, 0.5 at the center, and one at the top. So we have a zero to one representing the position in that line. So our closest center point is the percentage times the change in x's plus the bottom point. And let's plot that point to see it in action. And ah, okay, it's good that we saw this. We shouldn't be testing angled walls with horizontal or vertical. So we can avoid this by adding a continue at the end of these checks. Let's see how that looks, and that's better. Kind of, but you can see it extends infinitely in both directions. Remember how the line goes from 0 to 1? Well, we can skip this line if that value is above or below. But what about adding that little extra on the offset of the edges? We can divide half the wall's offset by the length of the line, and add that to the edges for a little bit extra. Next, we check to see if the distance is within our wall's offset range. And we can use the cross product to show if the player is on the positive or negative side of the line. And the x and y offset is just the line vector times our wall offset. So if the player is on the positive side of the line, subtract that small difference between the player and the wall offset, and same for the Y, and flipped for the other side of the wall. And hey, there you go. Wall collision detection for all possible 2D lines. Now before you leave, I've been dying to share this with you. I wanted to bring this up in my Raycaster and Doom programming tutorials, but I didn't have time. 
A good way to limit the number of walls to draw or collide with is to separate the level into smaller chunks called sectors. So maybe the player is inside this first sector, so we only need to calculate these wall collisions, and not in this sector's walls, or this one, or that one. So it's a great way to limit the number of walls you're checking for collision. So let's add one more wall to seal off this sector. And we can turn off collisions for now. Okay, my brain was blown away when I found this out. I thought there was some super crazy mathematics like adding up the corner angles and dividing by the area of the quadratic hypotenuse raised to the Pythagorean exponential log, but, but no, it's actually super simple. The way we check if this point is inside this or any shaped closed polygon is to count the number of lines left of the player. If that number is even, we're outside. Odd, we're inside. Yeah, like it's that simple. L let me show you. So let's keep track of the number of sectors, and we'll create a struct of sectors, and a sector just holds the starting and ending wall number in that wall array. New function to cycle through the sector walls, which is actually zero now that I think about it. So let's initialize this sector to have walls zero through four. So let's set each wall color to black to start with, and we can change the color later if we're inside. Hold the variables and order the Y values from bottom to top. That way we can quickly check, is the player below, above, or right of the line? Forget about this wall. Skip it. Move on. You, you deserve better. Only if it's left do we add one to your counter, which we can create right now. If it's a diagonal line, we need to use that cross product just like we did before to see which side of the line we're on. Left side, add one. And if it's odd, we are inside. Cycle through all the walls, highlight red to show that we're inside. And this is literally pixel perfect. It always knows if we're inside that polygon. And it doesn't matter if it's concave or convex. And many video games have to use this to divide their level into smaller chunks. And this is why speedrunners oftentimes have out of bounds glitches, but they continue until they find that next sector or loading zone. So the game will reset to being normal once you're inside. And I'm programming my own 3D sector game engine on the old Game Boy Advance right now. And I'm using the same collision detection and it's working great, and that's why I wanted to share it with you. And my game engine is similar to the Duke Nukem 3D game engine. And I heard a speedrunner say this after finding a glitch that caused the walls to cave in on itself. But if you tip on this door, then it pretty much slipped in on itself, and you can even see on, on the map. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing in the code that should actually allow factors to change like that. And this is true, and it's the same for my code. I never directly change the sector of wall points, but I did notice that when I shift the map closer to the origin, and the player was close to the x-axis and looking into the negative space, my sector points changed. In very much the same way, it's a weird effect, I believe it's caused by negative values, especially problematic when you have lookup tables, so it can happen even if it's not directly coded that way. Hey, listen, I just want to thank you for checking out my video. I really hope you found this helpful or at least interesting. I think programming can be fun, and it's easier to learn when it's visual like this. And feel free to share with me anything you make. I hope we can hang out again sometime. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.